We're going to move on to the looking at the respiratory system on checkers. Um, here again, we're going to start with, so just stand back and look, try to observe things, see what he's doing as far as his respiratory rate, his respiratory effort. What's the effort here at the nostrils? How much flaring of the nostrils uh, is there? You know, the signs can vary from day to day. It's, it's one of those interesting things about the respiratory tract. So taking a good history is going to be very important. The uh, ambient temperature, the humidity, mm -hmm. the pollen count. You know, just like you and me, horses that are allergic are actually pretty sensitive to the pollen count on a given day. It's true. They're sensitive to uh, the bedding, the sweet straw type of hay that they might be fed. So, uh, and these are all, like you say, day-to-day -day things that will happen and change the way the horse is feeling. A lot of times when we're standing back looking, we're uh, you know, talking with a client, eliciting a history, that sort of thing. I, I did want to point out, many times when I'm working with a veterinary technician, the technician gets a piece of the history that the client won't say in my presence. You know, I'll have gone out to the car to get my stethoscope, and they'll do that little throwaway line that gives the technician the thing that I didn't even hear. So it's real important. You know, you're doing a big job for us, both holding the horse and listening and being a part of the overall team. Yeah, the team approach is always important, and we'll keep emphasizing that. So let's go on to the actual examination now. When we're examining the respiratory tract, we like to start at the front and go to the back. It's real important with any of the systems to develop a consistency of approach so that you don't tend to forget things. You know, if you do things over and over the same way, you're, you're going to actually not forget things as you go along. So I'm going to start here at the very front of Checkers, who really seems to be interested in me. And first thing I'd like to do is take a look at his nose. I'm looking for exudate. Uh, actually, as he breathes out, I'm sort of sniffing here to see if there's any abnormal smells. I mean, if you, if you have certain kinds of pneumonias, you really will get sort of a nasty smell or some kinds of sinus infections. I put my finger up in his nose or take a look up in his nose. I might run my finger up in the false nostril, looking to see if you've got any little tumors, growth, that sort of thing up in there. While I'm here, it's a good time to take a look at his mucous membrane. So I'm going to lift his upper lip, see how nice and pink they are. And I'll blanch them and count that one, two seconds for them to come back to just about perfect. I want to take a look at his face, look for symmetry. You know, his head is actually full of sinuses, you know, the frontal sinuses, that sort of thing. And a lot of times, horses will get sinus infections, which will cause a unilateral nasal discharge. If you're looking at a horse for a sinus infection, one of the things you might be doing is, is percussing him, which uh, is a real art form, but you're, you're listening for differences in sound and dullness of tone, because, of course, I don't know if you can hear that, but... It has that nice hollow sound in there as you percuss over those sinuses. Now, a horse that's got a sinus full of pus or fluid frequently resents that sort of thing as you tap on his, on his head. Would you like to interject in that, Dr. Hamill? Well, it's, like you said, first of all, it is an art form to be able to percuss. Um, and I probably can't pick it up so much on percussion as we do uh, with symmetry. And once we get a problem going here, often we see some bulging, we'll see a nasal discharge. Uh, so you have to add all the things together, don't you? Sure. Next thing I do is I move back on him is I'm going to do some palpation. I'd like to palpate his submandibular lymph nodes a little bit. So when I say submandibular, I mean right underneath the mandible here. And right here between the two mandible, he has lots and lots of lymph nodes. And just like with you when you get a cold, when he starts to get a little respiratory infection, a lot of times you'll palpate a big lymph node there. So I come back over the larynx, I palpate his larynx. A lot of times in a horse that's got an upper respiratory problem, he'll have a cough. If I pinch his larynx right there, you know, he might reward me with a cough, but Checkers is sort of a healthy soul, so he's not going to give me a cough. Also, I'm looking to see for his thyroid. Now, Checkers doesn't have the most beautifully visible thyroid because he's sort of thick through the throat latch here, but it's right in there. I can run my finger over it and palpate it. I just can't pop it out for you to see. That's one of the things that clients will all of a sudden discover the thyroid land on their horse. And it's kind of the size of a half of a golf ball. And it sits right there where Dr. Forney showed you. And people will go for years and not realize and suddenly... They call you on the telephone and they talk about this lump that they see in the horse's throat. And we, over the telephone, usually can tell that it's the thyroid gland that they've just 
suddenly discovered on the horse. Well, it is. It's freely movable. So yeah. sometimes very it's peculiar. Uh -huh. <laughs> so then next thing we're going to do, running front to back, is we're going to run our hands down the trachea. Right down the trachea. And, and of course, that's right midline. And as you run your fingers down it, you can actually palpate the rings on a nice plump boy like checkers. You can palpate the rings with a little bit more difficulty. But you can run your fingers right down. It's right there going into the thoracic inlet. Uh, if you were ever in an occasion where the veterinarian you were working for needed to perform a tracheotomy, tracheostomy, it would be done between the rings in the upper portion of the middle third of the trachea. So right in there would be where you clip and prep. Okay, let's move on down to the rest of the respiratory system. Great. Before we start to sculpt Checker's chest, Anne, let's you and I go over how to use the stethoscope. Okay. All right. First trick, of course, and you probably know this, is to put it on with the earpieces going forward. Always a giveaway that someone's not familiar with their stethoscope if they're putting it in backwards. You won't be able to hear a thing. Hmm. So you go ahead, you put it on. And the other little subtle thing you do is you just tap your diaphragm to make sure that you've got that thing pointing the right way. There are two sides to a stethoscope. There's the bell side, there's the diaphragm side. Usually in human medicine, you'll see your doctor using the bell side. But on animals with fur, you're going to use the diaphragm side. Because after tapping it, make sure that's when you go ahead and go to the horse. And we'll start with the trachea first. One of the things we want to be sure we do in examining the respiratory system is to get the respiratory rate on the horse. Now, we talked about standing back and looking at the horse in the stall, and that's the time that we can get the respiratory rate. We're standing here alongside the horse just by watching down in this area, the excursion of the thorax, we can get a rate. One of the other things we want to pay a lot of attention to is here in these abdominal muscles, uh, how much effort is there going on with those muscles? Because sometimes when we have allergic uh, problems and the horse is having trouble expelling the air, expir expiring the air, um, you'll see a lot of effort here with these abdominal muscles. So pay attention to that. Uh, maybe a circumstance where it's easier for you to get the rate just by feeling the air coming out his nostrils. Often the tech standing here holding the horse it almost subconsciously takes a respiratory rate just by feeling the air coming out of the nostrils. And another way, um, and a lot of times with exercising horses, uh, if they've just come off uh, a run or something, we want to get a respiratory rate. The easiest way is just to listen to the trachea and just count the in and out air movement here at the trachea. Okay, so that's uh, some of the ways we get a rate. Um, Dr. Fornial discussed a little bit more the auscultation of the thorax on the horse. In keeping with our program of starting from front to back, when I begin to scald a horse, I first start over their trachea. And when I'm listening to the trachea, I'm listening for abnormal sounds. Normal sounds in the trachea are just like air moving through a large pipe. If you hear anything wet, that's abnormal. So I'm going to start up here at the top, right beneath the larynx. Listen there. Listen in the middle. And then listen down low over the thoracic inlet. From there, I proceed on to the lungs. Usually, I start just above the heart, here where the airways are the biggest. Now, Checkers carries a little excess body fat here, so I'm looking for a big airway so that I can actually hear something and sort of tune my ear up. I'll listen here for two or three breaths. And I'll move a little bit further back in the lung fields where the airways are smaller. And move a little bit further back in the lung fields. And again, on a horse that carries a certain amount of flesh, as I get further back, I'm not going to hear so well. So we have some tricks. You know, it's difficult to ask the horse to take a deep breath, but we have some tricks or some devices that we use in order to persuade them to take a deep breath so that we can hear better. One of the ways that we persuade a horse to take a deep breath is actually by occluding their nostrils. So we're going to ask Ann to go ahead and pinch Checker's nostrils here and get him to take a deep breath at the end. Notice he's got a pretty good hold of the nostrils there, so he's getting very little air uh, through that. And he should start to show a little bit of discomfort here. Yeah, I see him struggling a little bit. He's getting a little air hungry. 
Now, before he gets really disturbed about this, you want to let go. Now he's going to be taking his deep breaths, and Dr. Forney is going to be listening back there at the lungs. Uh, and notice she's moving her stethoscope around at several different places, getting a breath or two at each site. So she has a pretty good survey of what's happening. Now, a normal horse usually will have, uh, take about three or four deep breaths after you've held him off, and then it'll be back to normal, and a normal respiratory depth and, and, and rate, and that's normal, and I consider that to be okay. If we see a horse that's being delayed that way, um, and is taking more deep breaths to come back to normal, um, I get a little suspicious that we might have some lung problems going on there. Now we're going to demonstrate the rebreathing bag. Another way to persuade a horse to take a deep breath is the use of a rebreathing bag. Rebreathing bag, at least what I use, is one of those large white kitchen trash bags. Nothing very technical or difficult. And it's sort of interesting. The horses are always fascinated. They must think there's something good in here. So get a little space in the bag. Get a little air in the bag. Bring it up over the horse's nostrils. Now, the one thing they don't like is they don't want the plastic back in their nostrils. So the person who's handling the horse should hold it nice and tight. And if you have another person to help you keep it away from their nostrils, that is a big help. Now, you've got lots of time because they've got some air in there and they're going to build up carbon dioxide and start to take some deep breaths. So I can go ahead and listen to the chest. Okay, so he's checking his starting to breathe here. You can see the bag going in and out. He's going to start to get a little air hungry here. Um, so he'll take deeper breaths there. Dr. Forney has some time to listen uh, again all through the lung field. She can spend some time trying to evaluate that. Um, and we're going to let him breathe this uh, stale air here um, and get him a little bit a bit uncomfortable, but we're not going to, again, lose control over him. And when she gives a sign, we'll take the bag off. And he's going to take some deep breaths now, really deep breaths. And she gives her a chance again to look at the, uh, listen to the, to the lungs and uh, go all over the spots. And remember that the horse has a uh, right lung also. So that if you were doing this on the real examination, we'd be listening to the left side. We might reapply the bag again, go over and do the right side. Um, the other thing, because when the horse takes these deep breaths, uh, this can sometimes elicit a cough response. Right? If he's got any irritation in his throat or in the lungs, he's, this is apt to induce a cough. So we want to pay a lot of attention to that also. Before we leave the respiratory system, I just wanted to briefly go over some of the other forms of diagnostics that we might use but we're not going to demonstrate today. Uh, these would be things like a transtracheal wash or bronchoalveolar lavage or uh, radiology would be one or perhaps ultrasound of the chest would be the other types of things you'd use for specialized instances. Right. A lot of times we have, um, there might be fluid in the chest. The ultrasound is really going to pick that up. Um, radiology is particularly uh, advantageous with your foals mm -hmm. and ultrasound of the lungs also with the foals. And sometimes we just can elicit uh, information by exercising the horse. As we uh, stand there, listen to the horse as he is out exercising, runs by us, uh, we can hear uh, the type of noise he makes. And this will sometimes give us guidance as to where we might have an obstruction, where we might have some difficulty, or some characteristic sounds that a horse can make under exercise. So there's lots of different ways that we'll try to evaluate the respiratory system. But this pretty much winds up some of the routine things we can do or we can do without a lot of fancy equipment. But let's move on to another system.